Coming up on the best indie games of November 2016, a lighter take on the beautiful game, a landlord from Hell Simulator, and a platformer that took 10 years to make. But first, we have a big announcement. This year, the 10 best indie games will be decided by you, the viewers of IndieFormer. Just take our survey, link in the description, to pick which games you think are 2016's best. We'll tally up the results and put out the final video on December 31. For full details, head on over to our subreddit. And now, back to the top 5 indies of November. Annapurna Studios, the company behind Hollywood films Her, Zero Dark Thirty and Sausage Party has entered the independent publishing game under the name Annapurna Interactive. Already they've announced that they'll be publishing two games. The first is Gorogoa a hand-illustrated puzzle game in the vein of Framed and will come to PC and mobile quarter one next year. The other is What Remains of Edith Finch, a collection of short stories about family from the creators of The Unfinished Swan. It'll also come out in quarter one next year and be available on PC and PS4. Aria is a first-person horror game predominantly designed for VR but also playable on PC. It's not too long, the story is above average, but Aria is frustratingly let down by outdated graphics and shoddy sound design. Breakup Squad is an asymmetrical team-based game in early access, with only the first level playable. The aim of the game is to keep two exes away from one another at a party. Currently it can only be played locally and with a minimum of five people. Feral is a very pretty first-person hunting game set in a world with weirdly wonderful creatures. The work of seven French students, Feral is currently just a prototype and significantly held back by download issues and crashes. Still, the project has a lot of promise. Memoir and Code Reissue technically released back in September, but we only found it now and it would be remiss if to count it out on a technicality. The game is a short autobiography designed like an album. For instance, instead of a track list, it has nine separate games set at different parts of the author's life. An impressively experimental way to express emotion and tell story in game form. After two and a half years of early access, Planet Explorers has now been fully released. The self-published open world sandbox adventure is incredibly ambitious, and as such the game still feels undercooked. The developers will continue to tweak it, so it's worth keeping an eye on if interested. Now, let's get to the top 5. Bullshot is your classic side-scrolling run and gun game. You're always on the move and under fire. A common design theme is multi-storied levels. Aside from giving you a lot of ladders to tediously climb, these multi-leveled areas mean that projectiles come from all angles, and that you'll need to constantly adjust your aim. If caught out, you can preempt missiles by shooting them, helping you suppress the storm of bullets. More significant respite comes in the form of taking cover in the shadows, where you're invulnerable. Bullshot is largely a game that follows pattern of a well-worn genre, but this one deviation gives Bullshot its own rhythm. The same can be said of the bull's movements. He is slower than the typical agile run-and-gun character, and even slower than most characters in side-scrollers. Although, if he tucks his gun under his arm, the bull can charge away from fire in blistering fashion. If he wants to shoot, however, he must return to his lethargic strolling. These are little details, but they are what make Bullshot its own game. The graphics are simple, but the shadows and lighting make them a tad more sophisticated, as do the four interchangeable filters, each of which depicts a retro TV screen. There are nine levels, a few bonus stages, and an underwhelming multiplayer mode. What ultimately makes Bullshot is its difficulty, chucking you curveball bosses and never once letting you waltz through a level. Just out of early access, Bullshot is a dependable run and gun game that should satisfy genre regulars. All-Star Soccer is to soccer what NBA Jam is to basketball and what Super Mega Baseball is to baseball. Perfect visuals, precise stats and the pursuit of recreating a sport to every noble degree is traded in for a simpler and arguably more fun arcade experience. 
there's only 7 players a side as compared to the standard 11. And they're all bobble-headed cartoons from countries obscure as New Caledonia and as familiar as Germany. Some teams are even Halloween themed, like the team of pumpkin heads or the pack of werewolves. The rulebook is further thrown out the door with a unique take on slide tackling. Usually, sliding someone from behind would net you a red card. Copanito, however, not only permits the practice, but encourages it. Sliding from behind will get you the ball and briefly knock your opponent out. Of all Copanito's quirks, this mechanic is certainly the most satisfying to use. That's not to say Copanito is a skillless hackfest. There is an art to sliding, with timing being the key, as it is for volleys, headers and lobs. Copanito strips back more complex manoeuvres like through balls and dribble moves, leaving you to master a few essential skills. For all the features and details of the likes of FIFA and PES, it's refreshing to have a soccer game that lessens the importance of game knowledge. As you'd imagine from a game of Copanito's ilk, there are power-ups like those found in the vast catalogue of Mario sports games. We're not too sure if they're that effective, they're certainly not game-breaking, but at the very least, they heighten the potential of hilarity. Halves can be as long as 6 minutes, but we found at that length the game dragged. To be fair, that could also be a product of us playing against an unchallenging AI. Overall, we found the 2 minute halves more suitable, especially when you're playing a tournament with lots of matches. Copanito is the type of game that is best played with others, and the game offers various ways to do this. You can play with, up to, or against 5 friends. There's also online play, which is unfortunately the great tragedy of Copanito. From our experience, it's almost impossible to find a game online. Browsing the web, we found similar user experiences, and even some reports of lag once a game had actually been found. Copanito is a fun, arcadey take on the beautiful game. But if you're thinking of buying, be prepared to play solo. Shenzhen IO was an early access honourable mention just last month, but it's now fully released and much deserving of a place in November's top 5. The game comes from prolific indie developer Zachary Barth. Those familiar with his work may notice that Shenzhen is kind of a hybrid of his last two games, combining the product design of Infinifactory with the assembly language programming of TIS 100. Basically, you write code and make electronic devices. The devices you make are commissioned by a new employer, who've brought you to Shenzhen, China to work. Your first few tasks, like setting up laser tag equipment, seem trivial. However, your co-workers start to hint that your work will suspiciously secure the company more defense contracts. It's easy to get carried away with all the programming and lose sight of what your designs are being used for, including possibly being complicit in something immoral. Your co-workers will email you throughout the game, keeping the plot running and adding personality. Where the story really shines is when it's told through your circuits and code. For instance, you may start to question why the alarm you're installing goes off at times. It probably goes without saying, but Shenzhen requires a considerable investment of time and brain power. And with its very own programming manual, Shenzhen also creeps into job simulation territory. There are many gamers that enjoy this kind of game, but if you don't, you've now officially been warned. All up, Shenzhen IO is a very rewarding experience in coding and electronics that'll test your brain and creative problem solving. Beholder is yet another game that warns us of the dangers of a totalitarian state. The popularity of this thematic subgenre seemingly began with 2013's Papers, Please. Since then, the Newport Independent has explored it via the repression of the fourth estate, and Orwell has applied it to the realm of contemporary technology. Apart from the Newport Independent, all these games put you in the uncomfortable position of a state-employed citizen, torn by a conflicting set of loyalties. Beholder is no different. It makes you a landlord of an apartment complex secretly hired by the state to spy on its tenants. From here, many problems arise. As you enter, you see your predecessor being carried away, presumably to jail or his death, immediately spelling out your precarity. 
The new position has afforded your son the opportunity to attend university, but your wife is upset with you, scared that you'll meet the same fate as your predecessor. The drama is captivating, but for the most part is charted territory. That's not really a problem however, as Beholder's point of distinction and greatest accomplishment is how its unique presentation captures all its conflicts. The most obvious example is its camera view. The front on view of the entire apartment complex, also found in this war of mine, allows you to see everything at once. So as you break in and plant a camera in the dark of a tenant's apartment upstairs, you can see your wife pacing and fretting below downstairs. This is also inherent in the gameplay, as you need to keep an eye on the road for the bus returning any tenants home. This is what makes Beholder so compelling, as all its conflict is laid out before you always. It's also what makes it such a challenging game. The deceitful and paranoid existence you live as the all-seeing double-dealing landlord is extremely burdensome. The shadowy art that envelops every character and the intensely haunting music further adds to this uneasy feeling and brings you into the world. Beholder is an intense game in which its conflicts are not only inescapable but at times suffocating. Most importantly, it's a fresh take on the issue of surveillance as explored through games, and definitely worth experiencing. Development started in 2007. It's taken 10 years, but it's been worth the wait because our boy is an instant classic. You play as Otis, the self-doubting and mute owlboy who constantly disappoints his hard-to-please mentor. Your first task is to watch over the village. There's no direct instruction, you just fly about, which feels amazing by the way, looking for any signs of trouble and following up. From seemingly nowhere, the story slowly builds and you find yourself chasing a troublemaking spider-like creature down a cave. It's typical of how owlboy just unfolds organically and in every way. New mechanics and enemies are introduced rapidly, but not so fast that you get bogged down trying to figure them out. They just pop up and fit into that part of the game seamlessly. It's an invisible feature, but the pace is incredibly refined, always keeping you engaged. Furthermore, it captures the nature of your mission. When chasing your spider-like target in the first real level, you feel the sense of immediacy. All these effects are the work of a lot of tweaking and testing, which is itself indicative of the level of care put into our boy. Its world is seamless, every environment connected. For instance, the shell of the first boss is used to smash a pillar and clear a path for the next section. The animations, the sound of your wings flapping, it is all wonderfully immaculate. Perhaps best of all is the delightful music that can only be described as magic. For us, it captured that same euphoric retro feeling from when we first played Shovel Knight. It's that good, if not better. There's so much more to talk about. The story, like everything else, feels naturally sewed into the experience. We've touched upon it, but the gameplay is varied and constantly evolving. Just switching between solo flying or carrying your good friend Getty and his pistol around changes the game dynamic. Our boy is terrific and we love it. If we were voting in Indieformer's 10 best indies of 16, it'd be one of the first games on our list. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time here on Indieformer.